wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood Good morning. Hey, welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. We're in the month of June already. It's crazy how fast this year is going by. But we're here to begin the month the way we begin all of our weeks, with worship, with giving glory to God. And as we begin our morning service, we have some announcements to highlight. First, we have some anniversaries and birthdays in the Peace Church family. Anniversaries this week, Hank and Tammy Gillig have an anniversary, Brian and Julie Schmidt, Steve and Judy Gazer, Chad and Jamie Lurkey, Mitch and Haley Grit, Luke and Mariah Fisher, Arlie and Jane Furman, and Ken and Sherry Hintz. Happy anniversary to all of you <laughs> with anniversaries. And we have some birthdays in the Peace Church family this week. Um, Carol Eckley has a birthday, Erica Hutterer, Luke's wife, has a birthday, Jamie Wheezy has a birthday, Leah Stecker, Ryan Strzeski, and Mara Stecker turned 17 this week. So happy birthday. <laughs> Few other announcements. We have a child care room in the back. We have a men and women's restroom behind that room in the back hallway. Also, Vacation Bible School is July 11th through the 15th at Camp Forest. Please have your children registered by Sunday, June 12th. Res registration forms are on the counter. We have an electronic recycling event Saturday, June 25th here in the parking lot, looking for two teams of helpers, one working from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., and then another team from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Proceeds are going to support the Peace Church Youth Group. Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Gifts. Our supplies for this program are low. We need help, and a list of the items we need are in the bulletin and on the church website. And also save the dates for our 17th annual Gospel Fest, August 19th and 20th. And now we're moving to the part where we want to recognize and honor our graduates. We have six students from Peace Church that have or are graduating high school. Um, the first person <clears throat> that I would like to stand up is Sadie Bartles. Sadie is graduating today from Chilton High School. She's headed up to Michigan Technological University, majoring in wildlife, ecology, and conservation. Sadie, congratulations. <laughs> Also graduating from Chilton High School today is Emma Bartles. Please stand up. Emma will be going to Northern Michigan University, majoring in communications. Congratulations. I'm, I'm graduating from Hilbert High School. They just had the ceremony. Griffin Keys, please stand up. Griffin is going to be attending Northeast Wisconsin Technical College for graphic design. Griffin, congratulations. <laughs> and Caitlin Raymond, please stand up. She'll be attending the University of Wisconsin-Madison in fall, majoring in biology. Caitlin, congratulations. Yeah. 
and Parker Kleppen will begin his apprenticeship with Furman of Brilliant to become a plumber. I don't know if Parker's here today, but Parker, congratulations. Um, also just graduated from Hilbert High School, Emery Wheezy. Please stand up. She's going to be attending St. Norbert College in the fall, studying either business or education. Emery, congratulations. Yeah. And all of those graduating were active and involved at different times all through high school in the Peace Church youth group. So we've been allowed to share with your joys and your accomplishments all through school. We love you guys and congratulations from Peace Church, your church family. And also at this time, I wanted to recognize all those of you who teach, those who teach in the public schools. And I'm um, Jean, did you have a question? Okay, we'll do that next. Okay, at this time, I, I wanted to recognize all those of you who teach public school, private school, and or teach here at the church. As you know, teaching's not an easy job. I studied to be a teacher and was a teacher before I became a pastor, so I'm, I've got your back. I totally get it. It's, a, it's an all-year-round job, and you take your work home with you. And the last two or three years have been particularly difficult with the pandemic, with the changes in culture and all the things going on in the world. We want to recognize you. All those who teach, please stand up. Oh, I'm Barb, yes. Yes, and those who teach school at home, homeschool teachers, please stand up so that we can give you our love and a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for giving to the Lord. We also have college graduates in the Peace Church family. Amber Hansen graduated from Mid-State Technical College she did the 720-hour police academy program. This is part of her four-year degree in conservation law enforcement. So she's going to be a law enforcement person. So congratulations to Amber. <laughs> Mackenzie Stecker, is Mackenzie here today? He graduated from the University of, hey Mackenzie, he graduated from UW Oshkosh with a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology, and he's working as a personal trainer at Anytime Fitness in East Appleton. Mackenzie, we're proud of you. Congratulations. Yeah. McKenna Keyes is with us today. She finished with in-school learning. McKenna, please stand. And at Concordia University, she now has six months of clinicals and field work and will graduate with her master's in occupational therapy in December. We are so proud of you. Congratulations, McKenna. Thank you. And also, um, continued prayers for Emily Duco. She's, I don't know how many more classes she's, she's got till graduation, but she's already looking at graduate schools, maybe going to a theological seminary for family ministry or youth ministry or um, counseling. So prayers for Emily with her next step. So congratulations, and we give thanks to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for our graduates. We pray your hand of guidance and blessing upon them as they go forth in the name of Jesus, representing the kingdom of God to the colleges that have been picked out for them. Help them to do their best at their studies. And we pray that you would provide for all of their financial and social and academic and spiritual needs in Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for our teachers. We thank you. It hasn't been easy. To, it's never been easy to be a teacher, but the last two or three years have been particularly difficult. We love and appreciate them so much. We ask that you continue to provide for them, give them grace and strength. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
screen. We believe that the Bible, consisting of the Old and New Testament, is the only inspired, true, authoritative, written Word of God. We believe that there is one God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God the Father, and ultimately, his personal return in power and glory. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit, whose indwelling power and fullness enables the Christian to live a godly life in this sinful world. We believe that water baptism and the Lord's Supper are sacraments to be observed by the church during this present age. However, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and his abundant grace provide the only basis for the justification and salvation of all who believe. We believe in the sanctity of human life at every stage. We believe in the spiritual unity of all who Good morning, everybody. We were saying thank you to the teachers for teaching, and we congratulated the graduates, but I want to congratulate you guys. A lot of you just finished a year of school, and it, sometimes it's not easy to be a student in these times, and so I just want to say I'm proud of you, too, and I'm so glad you came up, and I brought with me a big box, and this isn't just any big box. This is my Vacation Bible School treasure chest box, and I keep all kinds of treasure in here. And the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is the best treasure of all because you get God and you get Jesus in your heart, and they're with you forever and ever. So that's the best treasure. But it is fun to find earthly treasure. And so I wanted to say a prayer, and then I'm going to give you a chance to pick something out of this treasure chest. Did, anyone, did you have a question? Anyone had a question? Yes, yes Thomas. Um, Jesus, Savior, point me. Right, pilot me. Yeah, you, you guys are good readers. Holy cow. It does look like it says that. Yeah, somebody in the church made this box for me, and I think it took him like two months to make it. And I've used it ever since. We'll pick up the action in Matthew 13, verse 44. We're going to look at a couple of short parables of Jesus. And a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It is a folk story with spiritual significance. Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Let us pray. And Father, I thank you for these scriptures. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the scriptures and help us to bring out the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeannie and I were married 25 years ago this month. The time flew for me. I don't know how she feels about that, but for me it just flew by. And one of the wedding gifts we got was a 1996 limited edition rival Green Bay Packer crock pot. 
And when I saw what the gift was, I said to Jeannie, let's not open this. This is going to be worth something someday. <laughs> so I put it in the basement, and we left it there until last week. I went downstairs, and I brought up the limited edition crock pot, and I looked it up on Google, and guess how much the limited edition Green Bay Packer crock pot is worth today? $76.19. <laughs> it's not quite enough to retire on. <laughs> it's barely enough to take Jeannie out to celebrate her 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> that gift did not appreciate as much as I thought it would. <laughs> Well, today, we're going to go treasure hunting for something way more valuable than my Green Bay Packer slow cooker. Way more valuable than anything you can buy on Amazon. We're going to see that the kingdom of heaven is the treasure. Jesus is the treasure. God is the very great reward. And we'll talk about why a relationship with God is so valuable and how to experience the blessing of this treasure in your life. The message is called, The Kingdom of Heaven, Priceless. Matthew 13 records for us some parables of Jesus, and most of them are lessons in spiritual agriculture. Today's lessons are lessons in spiritual archaeology, spiritual treasure hunting. Verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Now, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God can refer to a number of diff different things. First and foremost, the kingdom of heaven refers to the realm of where God reigns upon the throne. We saw that last week in Isaiah chapter 6. We see it in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Jesus says in John 3.3, 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it's the realm where God reigns. Another meaning of the kingdom of of God or the kingdom of heaven is it could refer to the future reign of Christ on earth over the house of David in Jerusalem. Well, how do I know that? Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his kingdom and his government, there will be no end. And Luke 1, says the Lord God will give him the throne of the house of Jacob and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. But the kingdom of heaven not only refers to the realm where God lives or the government over which God reigns, the kingdom of heaven can also refer to the reign of God within us through the indwelling Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Luke chapter 17, verse 21, says the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, for the kingdom of God is within you. So you have the kingdom of God within you when you have the king of kings within you. You have the kingdom within you when you have a relationship with the God of the kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's what Jesus is hinting at in Matthew 13, verse 44, when he speaks about the kingdom. But why does Jesus say that the kingdom is like treasure hidden in a field? Why, does he, why doesn't he say the kingdom is like treasure in the bank or treasure in a safety deposit box? In those days, only wealthy people had access to banks, and they weren't so safe either. Thieves used to rob banks all the time, and they didn't have FDIC insurance on the banks back then. So if somebody robbed your money from the bank, you were out of luck. You were out of money after that. And it wasn't a good idea to hide valuables under your bed. Towns and homes were often raided by soldiers looking for valuables. So believe it or not, the safest thing to do at that time for many people was to hide their valuables out in the field someplace and bury it. 
Later in Matthew 25, Jesus tells a story about three men who were entrusted with the master's money. The first one took his five talents of silver and made five more. The second one had two talents of silver and made two more. And the third one was chicken that he would lose it, so he buried it in the ground. And that's what a lot of people did back then with their treasure. And when the owner of a buried treasure died or was driven from the land, his treasure would be lost forever until somebody found it. So Jesus' parable describes a very realistic situation. Now John Piper has a very good sermon on these parables, and it was very tempting to use that sermon in my own preparation. So I used it. And he says in his sermon that the landowner probably didn't even know about the treasure hidden in the field. It was probably put there by a previous landowner, and he didn't know about it. And the man who found the treasure, he could have been a hired hand or just somebody passing through the property. But he hides the treasure again once he finds it because he knows they don't practice finders keepers losers weepers that if it was found on the owner's property then it would belong to the landowner but he also knows that this is a once in a lifetime discovery he's so excited that he sells everything he has to get the field now let me ask you this should he have told the landowner that there was buried treasure on his land. Well, probably. I would like to think I would have said something to the landowner. But there are other unanswered questions that we just don't know about. Who is the finder? What is he doing in the field? Did he stumble upon the treasure and find it incidentally and accidentally? Or was he purposefully looking for the treasure? And what was the treasure? How did it get there? And who was the true owner of the treasure? And so these unanswered questions lead me to the conclusion that Jesus isn't telling us this story to give us a lesson on legality or morality. He's simply trying to teach us that the kingdom of heaven is such a valuable treasure that it's worth everything you have to get it into your life. That's what he's trying to tell us. And it gives the finder so much joy that he concludes, this treasure is going to give me the life I've always wanted. i got to have this treasure. i got to have this land. I'm going to purchase this field. I want you to know that on September 13th, 1985, I bought the field. I got the land. I received God's kingdom into my life through faith in Jesus Christ, and my life has not been the same since. Coming to Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church was the third best decision I ever made with my life. Second best decision was when I married Jeannie Stecker. But the number one best decision I ever made was buying the field receiving Christ as my Lord and Savior, receiving the gifts of eternal life and abundant life and forgiveness from God. And that is the best thing. And if you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you buy the field today, it'll be the best thing that you've ever done in your life. Some of you are stumbling upon this treasure right now. You're just finding out about the treasure by listening to this sermon. Others of you have known that there has been treasure in the field for a long time. But don't you think that now is the time to open that treasure? I mean, the kids were just up here. They took full advantage of the proximity of the treasure box to take the treasure that was going to bring them joy. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to receive the treasure of a relationship with him with great joy. And he doesn't want us to put it off. He wants us to take advantage of having the treasure with us right now through faith in our Lord Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field.
Then in verse 45, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. The merchant was a man who would buy things wholesale and sell them to a retailer. In the parable, he's not looking for just any pearls. He's looking for particularly fine pearls. In those days, they were the most valuable gem in the world. If you owned a pearl, you were rich beyond the dreams of avarice. Pastor Brian Bill says pearls were not easy to come by. Pearl divers would dive deep into the Red Sea or the Indian Ocean or the Persian Gulf. And one of the reasons why pearls were so valuable is that divers often dived looking for them. They didn't have modern diving equipment like we have today. They would tie ropes around their waist with heavy rocks and they would sink as far down as they could go to find the oyster, hoping that their feet didn't get stuck in the mud while they were going down there looking for oysters. And only one oyster in a thousand had a pearl. So it was extremely difficult to get a hold of one. That's why they're so precious. And the Bible talks about how precious pearls are. In Revelation chapter 21, it talks about the new Jerusalem and the streets of gold and the gates made out of pearl. And Jesus says in Matthew 7 verse 6 that when you're talking to somebody about the gospel, to do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Don't give your precious pearls of gospel wisdom and knowledge to people who are just going to make fun of it, deride it, and not want to have anything to do with it. Save those for people who are truly interested. Jesus says when this merchant finds a pearl of great value, he goes away and sells everything he has to get it. The expression great value refers to something, not something that's on sale like a great value product at Walmart. This is referring to something so expensive you can hardly put a price on it. I remember one time we took my mom and dad out for their anniversary at the Cleveland Shop House. And when we got to the table, I knew we were in trouble when we got the menu and there wasn't prices on the items of food that were on the menu. <laughs> Boy, the, the bill after that, that, that's what first started my bout with blood pressure. <laughs> the food there truly was priceless, literally. These pearls were so priceless, or this one in particular, made the merchant so excited he doesn't even care about how expensive it is. He gives everything he has in order to get that pearl. And to him, it doesn't even seem like a sacrifice. He was so happy with the pearl, it was no big deal for him to get it. Same thing for the person who found the treasure. It gave him so much joy and fulfillment and happiness. It didn't seem like a sacrifice to sell everything he had to get that treasure. That's how we should feel about a relationship with God. It should bring us so much joy, so much peace, so much fulfillment, so much happiness that it shouldn't seem like a sacrifice to repent of our sins and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It shouldn't seem like a sacrifice to live a life of obedience to Him. It shouldn't seem like a sacrifice to walk away from our idols and our false gods and turn around and give ourselves completely to Christ. It shouldn't seem like a sacrifice to go to bed 45 minutes earlier than usual so that you could get up 45 minutes earlier than usual and spend time with Jesus in the Word of God and in prayer. And it shouldn't seem like a sacrifice to dig into the treasures of the Bible with a good commentary by your side to help you understand and appreciate your treasure even more. And it shouldn't seem like a sacrifice to go on YouTube 
to and listen to powerful preachers like David Jeremiah and Tony Evans and Matt Chandler and so many others teach the Word of God. And it shouldn't seem like a sacrifice to take 15 minutes out of your day and read a book by an encouraging Christian author like Oz Guinness or John Stone Street or David Jeremiah or John MacArthur or Sean McDowell or C.S. Lewis. And you shouldn't consider it a sacrifice to give 10% of your time and talents and treasures for the furtherance of God's kingdom on the earth. Back on October 30th, 1996, I went to Uffenbeck's Jewelry Store in the Fox River Mall. They no longer exist. But I had $1,100 to my name in the checking account, and I spent 1050 of it on an engagement ring for Jeannie. I had $51 left for the next two weeks. I was practically broke after that. But it didn't feel like a sacrifice to buy her that ring because I was so filled with joy that she was coming into my life and going to be my wife that it was no big deal at all for me to give everything I had to purchase that ring. And that's the way we should feel about a relationship with Jesus. Philippians 3.8, Paul says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may be in Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness that comes from the works of the law, but righteousness that comes through faith. That is the true treasure that we need in our lives. You say, well, Mark, what makes God's kingdom so valuable that it's worth everything you're talking about, that it's worth everything you have in your life? Well, number one, the kingdom of God is powerful. Daniel 2, verse 34, mentions a rock that was cut out by, but not by human hands. And it crushed all the other kingdoms of the earth, and it itself became a huge mountain filling the earth. And Daniel 2.44 says that's what the kingdom of God is like. And John 1.12 says when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he gives you the power to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. He gives you the power to overcome your sin, overcome your past, overcome your bad feelings about yourself, and to become the person that God is creating you to be. You remember in the old Popeye cartoons, Popeye could never beat up Bluto until he reached into his pocket and he pulled out his spinach. And when he ate his spinach, that gave him the power to overcome Bluto. Well, when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And that's what gives us the power to overcome the Blutos of depression, the Blutos of discouragement, the Blutos of past failures. It is through faith in Christ and Christ alone and the power of God's kingdom at work in the one who receives it like a little child. The kingdom of God is powerful. Number two... The kingdom of God is eternal. When you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're receiving something that's going to last forever. I mean, if you buy a Sony PlayStation 4 video game system, you'll get some pleasure out of that video game system for a number of years, but eventually it doesn't work as well as the day you first bought it. It doesn't last forever. But a relationship with God is eternal. Jesus is eternal. So the kingdom of God is powerful, it is eternal, and number three, it is beneficial. Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So when you have Christ in your life, when you have the kingdom of God in your life, you have a peace that passes all understanding. You have a joy that abounds over everything else. And you have a righteousness that is imputed to you by faith in Jesus Christ. And since the kingdom of God is powerful, 
eternal and beneficial, what should we do? Because, you know, every sermon should talk about what does it say, what does it mean, what does it matter, and what should I do? Now we're at the part of the sermon where we talk about what we should do. This is what we should do. We should prioritize spending time with the king of the kingdom. How often do we get so busy during the day and so tired in the night that we just don't have the strength or the desire to spend time with God? We need to change our priorities and schedule that time with God. As you get older, one of the things you realize is if you don't plan it, it's not going to happen. If you don't schedule it, it's going to get forgotten. And you're going to be overwhelmed by the tyranny of the urgent. So you need to make that time with God and break open the Bible. Get yourself a study Bible because it's got notes to help you understand it. Spend time with your treasure. Just as a video game person loves to spend time getting to know the treasure of his video game system, we need to spend time getting into the treasure of God's word, experiencing the riches of his kingdom in our lives. And if you're not a Christian, today's the day to take that treasure into your life. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you and offers you grace and forgiveness and a life with purpose. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. <laughs>
want to remember Ken Monty in our prayers. He had surgery on his back. It went very well, but we pray for continued grace and healing in the name of Jesus. And for Lori Krieger, healing from ALS. Lori Neusheart, healing from cancer. Let us pray. God, I remember the scene in Revelation 8 where the angels carry the bowl of incense filled with the prayers of the saints. And I almost feel like that, that we've got this big bowl of prayers that we're bringing before you. Lord, we pray for Ken Monty for healing from his surgery and for relief from any back pain he might have experienced. For Lori Krieger, for ALS to be stopped in its tracks and for her to live a full life. For Lori Neusheart, for her cancer to be knocked into permanent, lifelong remission. Pray for comfort for Jamie Lurkey and her family. We heard about her grandpa's passing. May she know the comfort of Jesus. We pray for all those grieving and mourning the loss of a loved one, that they may know the comfort and consolation of Christ. We pray for Brody that Brody Gensky, Nancy and Dennis Schwalbe's grandson, he's having his tonsils out on Tuesday. We pray that that surgery goes really well and he'll be able to come home the same day. Pray for Tom Bear's mom battling back problems. Pray for healing and grace for her. For Ron Kleppen, June's brother, he's going to be starting treatment for his cancer tomorrow. We pray, God, that the treatments will successfully knock the cancer into indolence and remission. Pray for um, John Holshue's friend's family. His friend Ken passed away. May they know the peace and the consolation of Jesus. We rejoice with Carol Eckley as she turns 94 years old in a couple of days. We pray for Sherry Walber's stepniece, Tasha, who's having surgery for cancer, surgery on her spleen and pancreas. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the healing power of God be with her. We pray, Lord, for all the unspoken prayer requests around the room, that you would be close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Be with our leaders, help them to make wise choices, and we pray that you would raise up people who are God-fearing and are compassionate and will make wise choices. We pray that you would reign sovereignly over the kingdoms of men. We also pray for law enforcement, for our military, for teachers, for those who are in service ministries, EMT firefighters, paramedics, and pastors and teachers. Watch over those who watch over us. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward, we'll take up the morning offering. Father, thank you for these gifts and help us to use them for ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. And this table is open to all. 
who confess Jesus as the Christ and seek to follow Christ's way. In Luke's Gospel, we read that Jesus at the table with two of the disciples took bread and blessed and broke it. When he gave it to them, their eyes were open and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read that the church was gathered often in the homes of believers. They devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Jesus, the bread of life, we gather at your table to know you in the breaking of the bread. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give God thanks and praise. Holy God, we praise and bless your creation for the life you have given to us and for your abiding love. We thank you for revealing your word for us and the giving of the law and the preaching of the prophets. We thank you especially that in the fullness of time, We rejoice that in perfect victory over the grave, we praise Christ with power to the Lord of the universe. To us the assurance of eternal life with you. We celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and the institution of the Church by which your work may be done in the world. The faithful in every place and time, we praise with joy your holy name. Holy, 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 God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which will be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Consecrate, therefore, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine, and bless us that receive them at this table, that we may offer you our faith and praise, that we may be united with Christ and with one another, and that we may continue faithful in all things. In the strength Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, eternal God, and give thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. Come, for all things are ready. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Let us partake together. This is the blood of Christ, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us partake together. Let us pray the prayer of thanksgiving found upon the screen. We thank you, almighty, everlasting God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all of Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and help us to praise you with our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God. Born of his spirit, 
I'm washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his mercies, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. word of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin I 